Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today as we, as we reflect on Mary and God's call in her life, help us see ourselves. Help us see you at work in our own lives. Help us be open to what you want to do in us, through us, and for us today. And God, now I pray that you'll help me get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life and help each person here receive exactly the message that you need to speak to them regardless of the words that come out of my mouth. In Jesus' name, we all agree and say, amen. So today we're going to talk about the, the very first disciple of Jesus, the first one to say yes to following him through life, and that is his mother, Mary. Um, and, and I think the church through the ages um, in reflecting on Mary has done, has done two things. One, either lift her too high and almost worship her, okay, or ignore her completely. I think somewhere in the middle of that is the sweet spot because she's this incredible model of faith for us. She's this person who simply says, um, you know, I heard God's call in my life and I went through a process and I got to the place where I said, let it be. Let it be according to me as it is in your word, O God. Um, and that's a powerful thing to get to. And it's, it's hard for us to get to let it be. Um, I remember... It was uh, March of 2007, and um, minding my own business and, and out of the blue, I got a phone call from my district superintendent. That's the, the a pastor's boss in the United Methodist Church, and, and he told me, I need to come and meet with your staff parish relations committee. That's our personnel committee. And I said, why? And because, you know, the old way of doing it was in December, the church made a decision and the pastor made a decision about whether or not um, they wanted to come back. And that had been three months, four months ago, and it was long history. And he said, well, I need to come and meet with your committee because you're going to be moving. I said, don't we have something called the consultation process now? Um, that, that's not sounding much like consultation. And he smiled and laughed and said, no, this is the consultation. You're moving. Um, and I said, well, this is really complicated because things are fragile. Things are going really well here. I've only been here for four years. The assistant minister just told me last week that he was going to be moving on. You're going to move both of us at the same time. It's like, this is not, this is going to be rough. This is going to be difficult. And, and you know, things were growing, thriving. Um, we paid off our debt. Things were going really well. We were excited to be there. Denise and I um, loved living in that community of Fort Myers. And so we were... We were stunned. We were confused and disturbed, to say the least. Um, we had a lot of questions about why. And the DS would simply say back, uh, Jamie, just this is going to be a good move for you. Don't worry about it. And I thought, if this is so good, I wonder why it doesn't feel better than this. And I worried about leaving there, and I worried about coming here to be with you all. And, and the thing about it was, then it hit me. You see, when I came back to the church after being away from serving as a pastor, when I came back at 33, um, I decided I was going to take a different tack. I, wasn't, I was never again going to say, I'll only go here or there. Instead, what I was going to say from then on was, I serve at the pleasure of the bishop, and I hope it is the bishop's pleasure to return me to this church. So that's what I've said for the last 22 years. Um, and, and I remembered, that's what I say. So do I really believe that? And I did that uh, as a spiritual decision, as a discipline in my life that I thought um, I needed to make in my own spiritual journey. Well, in that particular year, it was the bishop's good pleasure to have me do something other than what I planned to do. In time, before we left there and before we arrived here, I began to see God's hand in this. I began to say, yes, Lord, let it be. And I was able to see God's hand of favor and blessing in the decision. And I still very much do. Now, the interesting thing is there's a standard pattern that winds up showing up in God's word when anyone is called by God. Um, it doesn't matter how big or how small it is, but the word of God, there's a certain segment, there's a certain thing that happens. First of all, God speaks into somebody's life. Um, God says, I want you to do this oftentimes through an angel, and, and human beings as well. Like a lot of times, um, people in our lives speak, and we hear God speaking through them. Okay, those are That's like an angel to us, all right? The second thing that we do once we're called is we object to the call. 
We have some reason as to why we can't do it and why we don't want to do it. And here's the thing. In Scripture, God listens to the objection, and then He promptly ignores it. Okay? And then God reassures the people. And then um, the people who are called get to this place where they say, let it be to me according to your word, O God, I am your friend and servant. Um, Here's the thing. You are uniquely called by God in some way. You may not have yet discerned that or you may have already lived that out, but the reality is, is God is always calling us and inviting us into something new. Um, and that's not just about being a pastor, okay? Um, people who just want to follow Jesus and have made that commitment to be on the way with Him in discipleship are being called into service, called into action for Christ, for God's glory. Um, when you say yes to Jesus and you receive His new life, God wants you to fulfill some new aspect of His glory. And here's the thing. You will object to the call. You won't want to do it. You will say things like, um, you, you'll tell God all the kind of reasons as to why you're the wrong person. Um, you'll say things like, um, God, I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm not qualified. I don't know enough. Um, I'm too scared. I'm too busy. I have too many problems in my life. I just don't want to. And, and here's the thing. As you lift up your ex- objections, God will listen carefully to what you have to say. And then he will ignore you. And just move right on to reassurance. See, in the Bible, God never, never um, settles for someone's objection. That is, God doesn't say, oh, you don't want to do this? You know, you're right. I think I got it wrong. I didn't mean to call you. I'll go look for someone else. Okay? That's never what happens. God, God is, is like relentless in pursuing us. Think about Moses. I mean, Moses, God shows up in a burning bush to him, and, and Moses says, uh, God, I can't possibly be a spokesman for your people uh, to free them from and take them to the promised land. I stutter, and oh, by the way, I'm a murderer. I'm just, I'm not qualified. And God doesn't hear any of that. God listens to what he's saying and then ignores him and then challenges him again, reassures him, says it's going to be all right. And then Moses says, here I am, Lord, send my brother Aaron. Okay? And says, Moses, I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. And God says, no, you're going to do it. And eventually Moses gets to the place where he says, let it be. Let it be to me according to your word, O God. Or how about Gideon in the book of Judges, chapter 6? Um, an angel is sent to him, and, and, and God's preparing to, to call Gideon into service to, to lead the nation of Israel um, out of some dark times. And, um, and we find uh, Gideon secretly hiding um, in a wine press, um, doing something that you don't do in a wine press. He's threshing wheat. He's moving the chaff and the wheat. So it's like, in other words, he's hiding in fear so that the people, the Midianites, wouldn't steal his food. And he's just hiding away. It's a terrible thing to do. It's the worst possible way you can imagine trying to separate wheat from grain. And an angel shows up, and he says, Gideon. Mighty warrior. Yes, that's the sarcastic angel. Because he's not not being a mighty warrior. And what is Gideon's first objection? He says, you can't possibly be calling me. He looks around as if there must be somebody else in the room. And he says to the angel, I am too weak. I can't do this. And Gideon even puts God through some through some hoops and makes him do some, some uh, things like, you know, I want some, I want some signs, God. I want some signs. I do not recommend this. Don't ask God for signs, okay? When you hear him call, just go ahead and faithfully respond. That's better. But God, God honors his request. And, and, you know, after listening to his objections and ignoring them, uh, finally God reassures him and he says, yes, God, I'm all in. Let it be in my life. Then we have, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's this other character in the Bible who, who lives out this pattern um, of, of call and, and then objection and then reassurance from God and saying, yes, I'm all in. And, and her call on Mary's life is, is a beautiful example of a, a really young woman living out her faith in the midst of, of real life, daily demands and personal struggles. Um, and I think it's important for us. We need models like this. 
um, for our own life. So we, we lift Mary up to honor her as the first disciple of Jesus, not to worship her, um, but not to ignore her either. And we find the story in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, where Mary is called uh, by God through the angel Gabriel. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, she was pregnant with John the Baptist, the precursor of Jesus. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. Uh, she was to, engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Um, it says then, confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. See, when God shows up in Mary's life through this angel, what's her first response? She is confused and disturbed, and rightfully so. When God shows up in our lives, when God is really present in our lives, guess what happens for the first time? We are confused and disturbed. Um, she thinks to herself, why in the world would God want to use me? I'm nothing special. I mean, I'm a poverty-stricken teenage girl from an insignificant village in an insignificant country. And she has tons of unanswered questions for God, tons of wonderments. And she wonders about herself to me, God, are you kidding? Why am I favored? And Mary thinks, if I were God, I wouldn't pick me to do anything. In one moment, Mary's there minding her own business. And the next, God has her confused and disturbed by his very presence in her life. And God does the same thing with and for and to us. When God showed up, it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us ever to find ourselves confused and disturbed in the presence of God. I mean, I am not the sharpest tool in the shed. I know darn well that I'm not good enough. I have baggage in my history. I have incredible limitations. And guess what? God calls me anyway. Guess what? None of you are good enough to be called by God either. God doesn't call us because we're wonderful, because we're nice, because we're incredibly moral. God calls us because of who He is, and God calls us in His grace to love and serve others whom He loves so much. Um, when we are confused and disturbed about God's call in our life, God's smiling and celebrating. He's getting a kick out of it. God is so excited for us. Why? Because he knows that if we'll stay in relationship with him, if we'll stay connected long enough with him, that this will then bring hope and joy and peace and love more fully into our lives. Verse 30, don't be afraid, Mary the angel told her. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give his throne, will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And it's easy for me to imagine that if Mary knew what was coming in her life as her future unfolded, her future of being highly favored and blessed, that she would be utterly stunned and reflective on what it meant. She could have said back to the angel Gabriel, hey, if, if I'm so highly favored and blessed, Gabriel, will you be staying with me through all that I face? Are you going to stop by my home and tell my parents this good news? How about Joseph? Who's going to tell him? Well, he gets another angel. But how, how will people in the village react to this in my life? I mean, at least they're going to shun me, and they may well stone me and kill me. This would be awful. How about um, why, will, why will crazy King Herod so desperately want to kill my son, your son, and so much so that we have to flee and go to Egypt for a few years? If I'm so highly favored and blessed, why will I have to stand at the foot of the cross and watch my son die? Why will I have to cradle his lifeless body in my arms and weep like I've never weeped before? You see, being highly favored and blessed doesn't mean a life of unbroken happiness. It means having God's joy in the midst of all of our circumstances 
no matter what it is we're facing. Um, the reality for us is, is we want God's favor and blessing to mean we have more money, we have more fame, we have more pleasure, we have an easier life. Things go better for us. But that's not what being blessed and highly favored means. God's favor and blessing means that, that in the midst of what is most painful, He is present. And I may not know what you're going through, but I know this. I know that nothing other than, than Jesus Christ is worthy of building a life upon. Not your good looks, not your great career, not your wonderful family, not all the money in the world, not your stuff, not power, not your education. None of that. If you want peace and genuine joy, the only place to find it is in a relationship with Jesus Christ where there will be times, I promise you, that you will be confused and disturbed. Can I get an amen? All right. You will be. It's just it's a reality for us. Um, and then Mary had a, a big question. It's really an objection, really. Um, and it depends on how she asked it. But Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. It's as if she's saying, Gabriel, um, are you aware of how babies are born? I'm 14, and I know, and that hasn't happened for me. So how, are, how is God going to make this happen in my life? What's this all going to mean in my life? Um, and the great thing here is Mary simply asks. She doesn't run away. She doesn't whine. She just has the boldness to say, Here's my legitimate question, because when we're confused and disturbed by the presence of God, it means it's okay for us to ask questions, to wonder out loud with God, what does any of this mean? And so it's a really good lesson for us in the journey of discipleship, because Mary deserves to know how God is going to work this out before she says, let it be, let it be unto me according to your word, O God. And Mary reminds us that it's important for us to take note of our own resistance to God's call in our lives and that it's okay for us to ask the questions about what this all means. Verse 35, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to, born, to be born will be holy and you will call him the Son of God. What's more, your relationship your relative, Elizabeth, has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. One of the things I love is in, 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 the, in the art of the Middle Ages, depicting this scene, it's called the Annunciation, where, where the Holy Spirit um, overshadows and over, uh, overshadows Mary. And, and here's, a, here's a picture of what that looks like. And the, above the angel Gabriel there is a, is a dove. And the dove is representing the Holy Spirit. And, and where, where is the Holy Spirit entering into the life of Mary? Through her ears. As she hears the Word of God in what the angel is saying to her is when she receives this reality into her life. Guess what? Mary has to be open to that. We have to be open to hearing from God in fresh new ways as well. Verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. And that everything about her would come true didn't mean that the adventure was over. Her journey of faith was really just beginning because she didn't know what this life of favor and blessing was going to look like. She didn't know that, that she would hold her dead son after he'd been released from the cross. But that was going to be the most incredible, painful thing that she'd ever experienced. And she still says, let it be done to me according to your word, O Lord, your word that will never, ever fail. So Mary goes in this one brief encounter, conversation with Gabriel from, from having a normal day to having her life turned upside down, promised favor and blessing that will look like difficulty and pain. Make no mistake, 
the life of favor and blessing oftentimes is accompanied by pain. It goes with the territory. See, it's hard. It's hard for us to be highly favored and blessed by God. For Mary to be open to God was to be open to hearing God say no to her plans, no to her personal hopes and dreams, and yes to his vision for her life. And the same holds true for us. And the key to Mary's greatness is her willingness to walk away from her plans and say yes to the plans that God had in store for her, embrace what God wanted of her, even though it was never going to be easy. And then nine months later, nine months after Gabriel visited her, uh, God would enter the world as a baby in a, a smelly stable through a 14-year-old girl who, who understood what God was up to in sending Jesus more than any other human being did. And she said, let it be. Let it be to me partnering with the Father to bring His Son into the world, the Son that would never truly be mine if He was God's Son. And God does the same for us. He wants us to, to invite that partnership into our lives, to be uh, Jesus' hands and feet and voice in a hurting and broken world 2,000 years later. So, when God shows up for you, count on being confused and disturbed. Count on the reality that you're going to have questions and that God permits you to cry out and to complain about what the call in your life is. But when God shows up, He is in fact going to call you. Count on that. You will object in all likelihood to that call in your life. Give thanks that when God shows up, He will listen to you. And give thanks also that then He will promptly ignore you and move on to reassure you and say, I'm going to be with you through all this so that you can get to the place where you can then fully say with great and abundant joy, I'm all in. God, I'm, I'm not only all yours, but I'm all in for letting go of my plans, taking on your plans for my life, and um, let it be. Let it be to me according to your word, O oh God. I am grateful. Trust that and simply say, let it be. Let's pray. God, thank you for um, your son, Jesus Christ, who was born into a world that of great need. Thank you for the example of faithfulness that we have in the discipleship of, of his mother, Mary, who comes to us as, as one who models the meaning of call um, and says yes. She lifts up her objections and, and you stand with her and um, you're for her. And she says, yes, God, count on me. Help us to count on you, to listen carefully for your call in our lives and to say yes, to keep saying yes, yes, yes. We're all in, God. Amen.